Hi everybody, Tony here. Last week's video was about the organization of reality. In it, we discussed various structures found in the universe and investigated their sizes and properties. If you haven't seen it yet, click the annotation on the screen or the link in the description to watch the video now. It's a great way to get yourself acquainted with how reality is structured. However, there was a lot of ground to cover in that video, and I wasn't able to talk about some of the really cool space stuff that I wanted to. So, in this follow-up video, we're talking about some of that cool space stuff. Specifically, black holes. Most people have heard about black holes, either through popular science media outlets or works of science fiction. Black holes are as interesting as they are fatal for anyone unlucky enough to wind up in one. Which was nobody ever, but uh, you know, hey, point still stands. In any case, if that interests you, and I really hope it does, stick around because we're talking about it today on Long Story Short. So, what exactly is a black hole? Well, a black hole can be defined as a region of space-time experiencing severe gravitational forces due to an extremely high density of matter. In other words, black holes occur when so much stuff is crammed into a small enough space that everything else breaks and gravity starts to override everything. Of course, it's not exactly easy to pull this off in reality. Just about all of the other forces will push back way before something could smush into a small enough space to become a black hole. In reality, black holes tend to form in space when large enough stars collapse into themselves at the very end of their lives. All at once, an entire stellar mass is concentrated in a much smaller region of space than it previously occupied. This usually happens with enough force and speed that all the material will actually overcome those other forces that govern our universe. Then, well, things get hard to describe. When gravity wins out over everything else, and we'll save what gravity exactly is for another episode, all of that mass keeps collapsing down to what is theoretically an infinitely small one-dimensional point with infinite mass, a singularity. A black hole is then born and it's got some really freaky properties. Let's discuss them in depth now. First of all, what does one of these black holes actually look like? There's the popular image of black holes as simply that, a black hole. But can you actually see a black hole? The answer is yes and no. If a tiny black hole spontaneously appeared in front of you and it were big enough for you to see it, you'd die. But if you didn't, it would seem to be a black opaque circle. Around this circle, you would notice a strange effect going on with the light as if it was stretched and warped around the black hole. Why would a black hole appear this way? Basically, it has to do with how the gravitational fields of black holes interact with electromagnetic radiation. This includes the visible light that we can see. The extreme mass of the singularity at the heart of the black hole deforms space-time, the fabric of reality itself, so drastically that the paths of the light passing near the black hole are altered. The light bends toward the singularity, and that bend is what distorts the edges of the black hole. Photons that get too close are irretrievably lost due to the intense gravity at the center. This lack of reflected or emitted electromagnetic radiation is why you would perceive a black hole as exactly that, a black hole. No light escapes. So to answer the previous question, technically you can't actually see a black hole because it prevents the raw light data from actually reaching your eyes. However, you can see its effects on reality. That's why we know they exist. Determining the actual mass of a black hole requires a little bit of mental gymnastics. All the black holes we know of are so far away, it's not exactly easy to run measurements on them. This problem is further complicated by the fact that black holes are entropy engines. This concept will be explored more later. For right now, just know that black holes seem to destroy information, and for this reason, it is difficult to gather information about them. 
One method for measuring a black hole's mass that does exist is known as the X-ray scaling method. Supermassive black holes can draw massive clouds of gas into their orbit with their immense gravity. As the gas falls into and around the black hole, it becomes more and more compressed due to the ever-growing density of the space around it. Sort of like how, when you pour stuff into a funnel, it may get bunched up and stuck at the base. In the case of a black hole, the force is so great that, one way or another, everything's going in. This disk of ultra-high pressure gas and energy is called an accretion disk. According to Joseph Gay-Lussac, the pressure of a given amount of gas held at constant volume is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. According to Max Planck, matter emits specific frequencies of electromagnetic radiation when it is heated. We're not going to get into the specifics of what that means, but by carefully measuring and observing the electromagnetic radiation emitted by the hot matter in the accretion disk, we can use those known properties to figure out the mass of the black hole. All of this technical stuff is cool because it provides us with a way to model the mass of a black hole even though they're so incredibly far away. But how big can black holes actually be in reality? Black holes are typically measured in solar masses. This is a handy astronomical shorthand unit that represents the mass of our sun. This is a lot of matter, but there's no shortage of matter in the universe with which to form these black holes. One recent observation linked in the description identified black holes of 100 solar masses. The supermassive black holes around which entire galaxies orbit may contain upwards of millions of solar masses. Now we know that black holes are massive, but how physically big are they? To figure this out, we first have to define the size of a black hole. Typically, the size of a black hole is accepted to be the area within what is known as the gravitational or Schwarzschild radius. This is the maximum distance from the singularity that anything can approach before being pulled uncontrollably towards it. The formula to find the Schwarzschild radius involves multiplying the mass of the object times something called the gravitational constant, doubling that and dividing all of it by the speed of light squared. The boundary this creates is commonly known as the event horizon. So what's the importance of the event horizon? Well, everything that passes the event horizon inevitably becomes a part of the singularity. For that reason, we can consider everything within the bounds of the Schwarzschild radius to be the black hole. We can't directly retrieve information on any matter past this point, including the singularity itself, because anything we send in there to do any measurements won't come back out. For all intents and purposes, things can only enter into black holes. Because of this, everything past the event horizon appears homogenous to an outside observer. We discussed this when we talked about what a black hole would visually appear like. You wouldn't be able to see anything inside the event horizon because it would appear to be perfectly and evenly black. Nothing escapes. So we generally just treat everything past that point as the black hole and call it a day. It isn't a physical solid boundary though. It's more the point of no return where even light stands no chance of getting out. But okay. Enough dodging the question, how big are black holes? Well, according to the formula for the Schwarzschild radius, the size of a black hole has a linear relationship to its mass. In fact, the Schwarzschild radius is properly described as a property of all groups of matter, denoting how much you must compress it before it collapses into a singularity. Let's explore some experimental values using things you may be familiar with. If we round a bit, Earth has a mass of about 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. If we plug this value into the formula, we get a Schwarzschild radius of just under 9 millimeters. To put that into perspective, in order to turn the Earth into a singularity, it would have to be squeezed down to the radius of about a nickel. I mean, this is a subway token, but you get my point. Anyway. Here's another example. The Sun, with a little bit of rounding, has a mass of about 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, which is orders of magnitude greater than that of the Earth. Plugging that into the formula yields a value of a little under 3 kilometers. For a black hole of 1,000 solar masses, the Schwarzschild radius would be a little under 3,000 kilometers. Again, it's a linear relationship. Now let's explore the defining feature of black holes their crazy gravity. 
All of these effects are consequences of its nature as a super dense singularity. From a distance, the gravitational field of a black hole behaves exactly like that of any other astronomical object of equal mass. This might come as a surprise to some of you. After all, when most people think of a black hole, they think of something that uncontrollably sucks in all nearby matter. But the process of drawing in more matter is not uncontrolled. It's just the gravity exhibited by the mass of the singularity, whatever that mass is. Because of this, from a distance, the gravitational field of a black hole behaves exactly like that of other astronomical objects of equal mass. For example, if the sun were instantly replaced by a black hole of equal mass, the deformation of space-time it creates would also be equal. This is, of course, glossing over the cataclysmic effects of replacing our sun with a black hole, especially those on life on Earth. But as far as the planet itself is concerned, it would just keep on trucking along around its orbit. Celestial movement doesn't drastically change at great distances from black holes. Things only begin to behave strangely when you get within spitting distance of the event horizon. Closer to the point of no return, the gravity of the black hole starts to cause a number of strange physical processes to occur. Any object that passes the event horizon experiences an effect popularly known as spaghettification. The gravitational effect of the black hole is stronger at the end of the object closer to the black hole. This is true of all objects with mass. Your feet are affected more by gravity than the top of your head. Closer to a massive singularity, these effects can become significant. Objects are pulled into the black hole with drastically more force at one end than the other. This forms a positive feedback loop as the close end accelerates closer to the singularity constantly faster. This effect would thoroughly shred any object entering a black hole, ripping it apart from the near end to the farther one. For a human, this would hurt a lot for obvious reasons and would ultimately be deadly. However, the image of an objective scientist turning into a spaghetti noodle is more palatable to the general public, so we tend to use the term spaghettification instead of matter shredding. But it's the same thing. Anyway, the extreme gravity of black holes doesn't just mess with space. Because, and we'll get into this more in some future video, space is a component of space-time. As the gravity affects space, it also causes local time dilation. Time dilation refers to the relative lengthening or shortening of time experienced by an observer with regard to another observer far away. Einstein's theory of relativity states that time, as perceived by an observer, can pass quicker or slower relative to another observer depending on where they are. This can happen in a few ways, one of which being when one observer is closer to a strong gravitational field. This has tiny but measurable effects on satellites and GPS here on Earth. Around a black hole, these effects would be greatly amplified. So, what would happen if someone fell into a black hole and experienced all this? Maybe without dying too quick, like they probably would. Well, this has two answers depending on which side of the situation you're on. If you are the person falling into a black hole, local time would slow down greatly. But you wouldn't notice this because it would slow down for everything around you too. Time is relative after all. If you could look away from the black hole, you would witness the universe aging at a faster rate than normal due to the effects of relativity. The rate of this aging would accelerate with an inverse relationship to the distance between you and the center, the singularity. As you fell toward the singularity and your local time slowed more and more, you would watch as the rest of the universe aged faster and faster up until the end, or your death. Whichever comes first, probably your death. On the other hand, if you were outside the black hole watching someone else fall in, something very strange and different would appear to happen. The person falling into the black hole would appear to slow down instead of speeding up. They would continue to decelerate until they were motionless at the event horizon. Strange, isn't it? That happens because the observer's flow of time would be unaffected by all that time dilation we were just talking about. So the person falling into the black hole would appear to actually be slower than normal. 
time would appear to slow down for that person at an increasing rate as they got closer to the singularity. The rate at which time would appear to slow down for them would be equal to the rate at which they would perceive the rest of the universe speeding up. Eventually, it would slow down to the point where they would appear to be stuck on the event horizon. This would be the last light image of them to escape before they cross the event horizon and eventually fade into nothingness. I've discussed data loss associated with black holes here and there in this video, but I haven't really explored what I mean by that. Let's discuss the entropic effects of black holes. In the context of thermodynamics, entropy can be defined as the degree of randomness in a system, or the disorder of the particles in a system. In the context of information theory, entropy can represent a function applied to a data set that induces irretrievable loss of information. It's kind of like when you mix two liquids together to such a point that there's no hope of ever separating them again. It is this concept of permanently destroying data that has special importance with regards to the effects of black holes. The no-hair theorem states that black holes only have three characteristics that can be detected by external observers. These three characteristics are mass, electric charge, and angular momentum. Black holes only exhibit these three characteristics because they destroy all other information, at least to outside observers, by rendering it irretrievable past the event horizon. Again, for all intents and purposes, things can only enter into a black hole. Nothing can escape. Mass, electric charge, and angular momentum are all physical characteristics that are inferred about black holes by looking at their effects on nearby matter. This phenomenon is the genesis for a problem known as the black hole information paradox. The matter that is absorbed into a black hole typically has more than those three characteristics. However, once it passes the event horizon, it is drawn into the singularity. No information can escape the singularity. By extension, the other properties of the matter that fell into the black hole are permanently deleted. This is a problem. It's a physical paradox. The quantum information of any particle should allow for its past and future to be derived, at least in theory. But black holes seem to completely delete this quantum information, violating that principle. There are numerous proposed solutions for this paradox, but none of them are without apparent contradictions that must be resolved with further research. Kind of complicates things a little bit. So let's look at the big picture. The entropic effect of black holes has some pretty severe implications regarding the eventual fate of the universe. One possible end of the universe scenario sees black holes eventually engulfing all matter in the entire universe. Once trapped inside a black hole, as we know, matter cannot escape. But there's a reason I've kept saying for all intents and purposes when I say nothing exits a black hole. Black holes do eventually evaporate away due to something called Hawking radiation. This process was first described by famed theoretical physicist and mathematician Stephen Hawking in 1974. In empty space in the universe, particles and antiparticles spontaneously form and annihilate each other. There's a lot more we could say about that, but for this video, just know that it's a thing that happens. Usually, the net result is empty space because, again, they annihilate each other. However, if they form near the event horizon of a black hole, then it should be possible that one half of the particle-antiparticle pair will fall into the black hole while the other does not. If this happens, they can't annihilate each other, and there is an imbalance in the total energy of the universe, something which shouldn't be possible. Therefore, in order to conserve the total energy of the universe, the antiparticle which falls into the black hole must have negative energy. To an outside observer, it would appear as though the black hole actually spits out a tiny particle and lost that tiny bit of mass. Over a very, 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 very long time, black holes will eventually evaporate all of their mass in this way. This would leave the entire universe in a state of cool sameness. Maximum entropy. Overall, I think black holes are some of the most interesting objects in the universe. 
The physics of such a gravitational singularity are very impressive to think about. The sheer power of black holes is just amazing. I mean, even photons moving at the speed of light, <laughs> the speed limit of the universe, cannot escape their grasp. I believe that's a truly awe-inspiring display of natural power. I also believe there's a reassuring quality to everything we know about black holes. The physics of black holes are not normal by any stretch of the imagination, but we've still been able to infer and deduce many of their properties. We've even determined what they are actually like. I believe that the combined body of human knowledge on black holes represents yet another manifestation of our amazing ability to unlock the puzzles of reality. As we inch closer to understanding the physics behind gravitational singularities, we move that much closer to uncovering the unifying forces that affect all of reality. So, as usual, I'm curious to know, what do you think about black holes? What did we discuss today that interests you most? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. This is Long Story Short. As usual, thank you all for watching. Really glad that we got to do a uh, follow-up video on black holes right away, just because <laughs> I think they're cool. It's uh, one of those rare things in the universe that uh, we sort of understand and that we can actually, in a few cases, point to and say, this is essentially the fabric of the universe, the universe itself being pushed to its physical limits. Um, in, in some ways, actually, the strangeness of black holes comes from the fact that it's kind of pushed past its physical limits. There is, of course, way more we can talk about just because there are entire books written on this stuff. But yeah, cool stuff in outer space. As usual, if you noticed any problems, any things that we got wrong, please let us know in the comments. Now that we've tried out a few of these longer form videos, we are going to be uh, moving back to some slightly shorter ones. More importantly, we're going to be changing the days that these videos drop from Thursday to Saturday, effective next week. So next Thursday, there will not be a video. There will be one on Saturday. Um, doing this just works better with our schedules. It means that um, Julius, our writer, will be able to spend a full week on scripts uh, because he's it's kind of staggered. They're about one behind the video. And I will now be able to spend a full week filming and editing as opposed to like <laughs> three or four days. I intend to use that time to continue to push the quality higher on here. Anyway, we'll be back next week with more cool stuff, more long stories, short. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. I will talk to you all next week.